The hot carrier effect is an effect where electrons manage to pass through the oxide of the MOSFET. At first, it seems similar to tunneling. However, it is very different both at the physical level and in how it affects performance. So, uh, I'm going to talk now about the hot carrier effect which is an effect that existed in all transistors to some extent or another, but it, it just, it's a lot more impactful in short channel transistors. And so let's just understand why it is more impact, impactful in short channel transistors and how we can sometimes use this effect and why we sometimes fear it. So in a long channel transistor, so this is the drain and we are in a long channel transistor, which usually also means that we are using a relatively thick oxide. And so this is the relatively thick oxide. And we apply a drain potential here. And this drain potential causes a, an electric field into the channel. But this electric field is not linear and neat like this. It's going to have um, some field lines that go into the body and also some field lines that go into the oxide. These field lines are going to um, then curve and go back down. And because the oxide is thick, they're not going to go too deep into the oxide. And perhaps I'm drawing them too deep here, right? They are going to only uh, extend into the oxide to a very shallow uh, depth. Now, there are electrons moving through the channel. And these electrons will reach the drain and will drop into the drain. What keeps these electrons from moving into the oxide? two things are keeping electrons from moving into the oxide. The first is the obvious. If this is uh, the channel band, conduction band of the channel, then this is the conduction band edge of the oxide. And the main thing that keeps electrons in the channel from jumping into the oxide or moving into the oxide is this barrier, this huge energy barrier. This barrier for electrons is uh, about 3.3 electron volts and it's over four electron volts for uh, holes because the barrier is asymmetric. So this is the first thing that's keeping electrons from moving into uh, the, the oxide. The second thing is that the electric field is mostly horizontal. So there are no vertical electric fields to promote electrons to move into the uh, oxide. So even if electrons had enough energy to move into the oxide, only very few electrons will go and follow these field lines and then they will curve back and go down again. Now, let's see the situation in a short channel transistor. So a short channel transistor, the drain is still relatively deep because we can't make it shallow because we are afraid of drain resistance. But the oxide is thin and this is the gate. And drain potential, V drain, which is proportional to the supply, is going to scale down, but not as fast as the oxide scales down, right? When we talked about uh, scaling, technology scaling, voltages generally don't scale as fast as dimensions because we have to keep noise margins at reasonable levels. And this means that the electric field, there's a huge portion of it that's going to be horizontal, but there's also a huge portion that is now a fringe field that goes vertically into the oxide. Yes. It mostly uh, curves down and goes back down again, but there are vertical fields. So now these vertical fields, which go very deep into the oxide, they actually might actually reach the gate. These vertical fields will promote electron motion into the oxide. But that wasn't the only thing keeping electrons from moving into the oxide. The other thing, which is really much more important, is that electrons at the edge of the conduction band in the channel have an insurmountable barrier of 3.3 electron volts before they can actually move into the conduction band of the oxide. They can't move here, they can't move into the band gap. Or other than tunneling, which is a whole different thing, they can't move into the, into the band gap, right? But the question is, is this barrier really insurmountable? Notice that we are talking about electrons at the drain. And notice also that we are talking about short channel transistors. This means that electrons at the drain are moving very fast 
In fact, what is the velocity of these electrons? For transistors around uh, uh, 100 nanometers and above, it's going to be the saturation velocity of electrons. But for electrons deeper than 90 nanometers, this is actually going to be close to the thermal velocity of electrons, which is really high. Right? So these electrons are really, really energetic. They have a lot of energy in the form of kinetic energy. And we are really unfortunate because they have the most energy when they are near the drain. And this is the place where we have these vertical field lines going into the oxide. And so the electron is not actually here. The electron is close to here. And it only needs to acquire just a little bit of thermal energy in order to be here and move into the conduction band of the oxide. So there will be a lot of electrons which have enough energy to go into the oxide. And there are favorable field lines promoting that these electrons move into the oxide. So they will move into the oxide. Now, if these electrons manage to reach the gate, that's actually not too bad. If these electrons move and move back down to the channel again with the field lines, that's also not bad. You know, that's not, that's not what we are worried about. What we are worried about, and of course, of course, electrons are going to move against the electric field. So don't let that confuse you. But um, that's not what we are worried about. Electrons that manage to reach the gate or electrons that curve and go back down into the uh, substrate are just going to dissipate more power. So this is going to probably ac account for excess uh, leakage current. What we are really concerned about is the fact that the oxide is rarely, if ever, pure. The oxide has impurities, and these impurities are inevitable in the fabrication process. However clean we try to keep our clean rooms, the oxide, the, especially during CVD, is going to accumulate a lot of impurities. What do these impurities do? The impurities do what impurities do to silicon. What did impurities do to silicon? They created states, right? And so you will find that the band gap of the oxide is not actually empty. It is full of states. These states are called trap states. Some of them are empty by default. And these trap states are created by uh, impurities, which are isolated atoms, so they don't create bands, and they are not silicon dioxide, so they don't align with silicon dioxide, and so they create states within the band gap. The problem is, some of these electrons that manage to go into the conduction band will become uh, less energetic as they move through the oxide, they will lose their energy, and they will try to go back down to the valence band. If they manage to go back down to the valence band, that's fine. The problem is they never do. They always hit one of these trap states. And if they manage to reach a trap state, they will remain there pretty much forever because there are no states available to the left or to the right. There are no empty states available. And therefore, there's no motion that's going to happen. This is an isolated state. So they will remain there. And so what's the problem with that? The problem with that is that now we have excess electrons trapped within the oxide. And these excess electrons will then create a counter electric field to the electric field that the gate is trying to impose. So they counter some of the electric field that the gate imposes. So what does that mean? That means that V threshold increases. And this is something called the hot carrier effect. It has to do with the fact that electrons become energetic enough hot enough to go through the oxide, uh, the oxide conduction band. But essentially, it also has to do with impurities in the oxide. This is a very tough problem to deal with because it is a reliability issue. It's not an issue that you can uh, discover immediately. It needs the device to work first because what is going to happen is that you're going to observe a rise in the value of threshold voltage but that rise is going to happen with time, with sometimes with a lot of time. So the more you use the device, the higher the threshold voltage becomes. And this is how you would observe the, pro the, the effect. So it's not something that you can detect from a quick lab test. It is something that probably needs uh, a stress test. Now, um, it's important to understand that this is completely different and totally independent from tunneling. 
This has nothing to do with tunneling. The hot carrier effect is an effect that can be understood fully from the band model. So looking at the band model, you can fully figure out what's going on. This involves no quantum physics. This is, involves no Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And the electrons are actually going through the oxide. In tunneling, the electrons don't actually move through the oxide. They just appear on the other side. It's a totally different effect. They're independent, they have nothing to do with each other. They don't even, they're not even affected by the same, uh, by the same factors. So the last thing is the hot carrier effect is a tremendous danger to our reliability, especially in short channel transistors. But when we talk about non-volatile memories, we will also talk about it as a friend because it helps us to program some, uh, some, of, the, uh, some of the memory arrays that are very commonly used, specifically NOR ROMs.